brother, um, and that is the habit. So it's a bit different than the thing is. It looks like the muscle here. It does look like Yeah, it could be. Thank you. <laughs> it's still, no, it's still, it's still, it's working. Let's see if it'll redo. Wait a minute. I'll try again. That's the chapel. I think in the hospital. No, no, no. I want to go home. Okay. Actual images. How did we locate people? We actually went to the rencontre of uh, uh, the Franco-American Heritage Center, and I went from table to table and asked. We had a lot of people that said that they didn't want to talk about the subject, and I think it was because they still believe that you know uh, there's something stigma. The stigma and the nuns are in sacred space. You don't talk about them on camera <laughs> you know, on their backs. I think maybe a lot of people have been more, very well trained to not to. But and there's also this mystery about some of the sisters. You know, for some small children, they, you know, they like they 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 said when the nun was sitting in their dorm space at night, they were scared because you know with veiling and so forth it looks like a ghost or whatever and they're young enough where that matters you know if you're five and you're not at home and you're sleeping in a wide open dorm room with lots of twin beds in it maybe that does look pretty scary so there is this negative experience associated with these places as well um, and you know I think Sometimes the sister that stuck out, stuck out the most for some people was the one that was considered mean to them. Dis disciplinary standards were really different. When Bart says she really cracked the whip, there might have been something involved there. I mean, I don't think it was a whip, perhaps, but maybe something along those lines, a strap. <laughs> because we're talking about the 30s, 40s, and 50s, where it's a different standard than what we come to expect today. Um, you know, I, I know people who t went to parochial schools outside of not anything to do with Grey Nuns. I remember being wrapped with rulers. Yes. And if we trace our, you know, uh, you know the Puritan ancestors in, in you know Rhode Island that I have, uh, you know, spare the rod and spoil the child was their motto. So I'm pretty sure they were worse. Um, yeah. So it was. And on the other hand, there are these wonderful stories about I remember Sister Teresa, and that's what I think of when I go by the gate. So, uh, there's a mix, and as one person said, you know, it's a mix of human beings. So, But I think that the models that were established for Lewiston Otter were unique, perhaps not unique to the whole of, you know, uh, I think perhaps like in Lowell, Massachusetts, there were, or Lawrence, there were also Sisters of Charity from Quebec. And I think that they may have used the same model of care. But I think this grew as it, as the need became known that we need to take care of these kids because their parents really need to work because no one is surviving in this depression. And uh, so moms can't stay at home. I think that, that, that they met that need. You know, they clearly met needs for uh, health care, uh, for elder care. Um, and you know the educational needs in the very beginning, and then other sisters like the um, daughters of Sion and the Dominican sisters, and as Elliot said in, in Augusta, it was um, the sisters' presentation, presentation of Mary. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Franciscans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you try to put anything in sunspots in the Sun Journal asking for people? I I haven't. People have mentioned that, but I have yet. Met. I, we have had lots of people come forward as. They've learned about the project, so I'm hoping I can talk to a former <laughs> nursing student. And if any of you have any sorts of connections, you know, if you know someone that was in the family that became a sister, uh, somebody who stayed at the hospital. You know, one beautiful old interview that we did before we were starting this project is about a woman whose dad worked on the railroads, got gangrene, and stayed at the, the hospital 
the gangrene part isn't the beautiful part of the story. <laughs> but he, um, he didn't have to pay. Uh, they never worried about a bill. All they had to worry about was his health. Mm -hmm. um, they knew that they were not going to be billed. They surmised that it was either the hospital or the railroad that took care of the bill or something in between, but no one knew. But they didn't even have to think about it. And that was what was brought up. So that's mm -hmm. something that's really good. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. Thank you. Really and I really I'd like to indicate that the Geary Asylum is now apparently going to be uh, converted into housing. Uh, certain government grants have been uh, awarded and, and uh, some plans have been made to, uh, in terms of the structure and the, the uh, changes that need to be made in the structure. So if there's uh, a historic building that is going to uh, serve new uses. Um, we uh, uh, will have uh, next February, next February is the next uh, formal lecture, uh, uh, presentation by uh, Jonathan Levante, who is the uh, executive director of the uh, uh, Land Trust, uh, to uh, talk about Tales of the Valley. And the valley is the Androscoggin Valley. Uh, and uh, we welcome you certainly to come to that. And if you've uh, given us your email address, we'll send it, send out the notice. Um, we do have uh, refreshments uh, out in the uh, hallway. You're welcome. And uh, you may see what you can find about these uh, pictures. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you very much Thank for coming. You. We appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff.